Mr. Quinn. Order. Mr. Quinn can multitask. He does show he has a softer side. I call Chris. I thank, call thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thought I'd have a go at waking Paul Quinn up as well. And, well let's, 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 let's Mr. Speaker, I can tell you now that what I'm going to do after this debate is I'm going to get the video clip of Louise Upston saying that she thought teachers had 14 weeks of holiday a year, and I'm going to send that to every teacher in the country because I think when they see the National Party's view that they have 14 weeks of holiday every year, they will all come flooding to the Labour Party in droves. So they will be so outraged at that, Mr. Speaker, because. Because, Mr Speaker, I know Louise Upston may think that it's 14 weeks holiday. She doesn't seem to, uh, she doesn't seem to uh, allow for the fact that in order to be in a classroom and teach students, they actually have, to have time to prepare the lessons that they're going to be delivered, to mark the assignments that the students actually do. It's not actually holidays that the, the teachers have for 14 weeks. And I think that perhaps if she visited one or two of the schools in her electorate, one or two, one or two of the schools in her electorate, she might actually have a bit of a... a bit. And Tolly seems to be shaking her head. She seems to think teachers have 14 weeks of holiday as well. I think that that probably just confirms what most of the teachers in the country think about the Minister of Education already. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very happy to have a call on the Education Amendment Bill number two, and I particularly want to acknowledge the work that my colleague, the Honourable Trevor Mallard, has done uh, with regard to, early to, to, uh, to the drop-off early childhood education services and the work that he has done around that. Limited attendance centres, I think, uh, is the, the term the government used for them. Uh, I think it's the, the amendment that's been put forward in the name of Trevor Mallard and uh, passed with the government support, I think is a, is a particularly important one. I think it's vitally important that when uh, parents are leaving their children with, uh, with, a, with a, an early childhood service, regardless of where that is and the duration for that, if that person is going to have uh, access to those children without any other form of supervision, there should be uh, you know, adequate safety measures in place to ensure that those children will be safe. And I think that the amendment put forward by Trevor Mallard uh, will help to ensure that that does happen. And I also think uh, um, it's good that the government have finally come to, part, to the party on that after spending weeks and weeks and weeks, as we've seen at question time over and over and over again, denying that there was even a problem with what they were trying to do. And I think that it's very good that uh, my colleague Trevor Mallard, uh, supported by the other members of Labour's education team, haven't let this issue go and have continued to push it so that we have uh, dragged the government kicking and screaming to what I think will be a sensible outcome in that regard. However, there are many other things in the bill that, uh, that will result in the Labour Party finally opposing it. Before I move off and stop talking about early childhood education, I do want to uh, pick up some of the comments that have characterised the debate around limited attendance centres. And the more the Minister interjects, the longer I will speak for. Um, so, Mr Speaker, the... Uh, that's an invitation. Please don't, don't hold back. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the limited attendance, some of the debate around limited uh, attendance, some of the debate around limited attendance centres, I think, has, has characterised some of the uglier side of the debate around early childhood education in general. And I tell you, it just really gets my back up every time I hear government members talking about early childhood education as babysitting. And we hear, about, we hear that far too much. And we have heard that in this debate and about limited attendance centres. I can go back and I can find quotes from government members of parliament talking about limited attendance centres as being no more than babysitting facilities. No more than babysitting facilities. And I'll tell you what, for the teachers who work in early childhood education, when they talk about, when they talk about early childhood education, they get really annoyed when they hear the government talking about early childhood education as being nothing more than babysitting. Nothing more than babysitting. And I tell you what, if the government don't understand the difference between early childhood education and babysitting, which has often characterised this debate, and because I tell you what, there are a number of MPs on that side of the House that don't understand the difference, that don't understand the difference between what a child at a limited attendance centre will do and what a child at an early childhood centre will be doing. They actually don't understand the difference. I had a National Party candidate show up in my electorate at the last election and stand up in front of a whole lot of early childhood teachers, kindergarten teachers, early childhood to teachers and talk about babysitting. I don't think the National Party got a single vote out of that room. 
I don't think they got a single vote out of that room. He was practically booed out of the room because those members on that side, too many of them don't know the difference. They don't actually understand what quality early childhood education is all about. And I'd suggest that they might want to take a little bit of time to, to learn the difference and to actually gain some understanding of that. Because if they did, then perhaps they wouldn't be doing the other changes that they're doing in early childhood education, like cutting funding for the centres that have fully qualified staff. Because in my own electorate, the Kindergarten Association in my electorate has lost a million dollars in funding because the government don't understand the importance of quality early childhood education with fully qualified and fully trained teachers, which is what kindergartens have a proud tradition of doing, and that is being compromised by this government's changes to the funding system for early childhood education, and it is absolutely disgraceful. And Anne Tolley's shaking her head because no doubt she'll be saying, oh, well, the centres can just increase their charges and, we're not, and, and you're not making it. Well, she hasn't said that. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. The million dollars the Rimataka Kindergarten Association are going to lose in funding next year. Where are they going to get that from? Where are they going to get the million dollars in funding? Where are they going to get the million dollars in funding that they're going to lose? The Minister cannot give an answer to where the Rimataka Kindergarten Association are going to get the million dollars in funding that they have lost because of her government's budget cut, because they don't understand the importance of qualified staff in early childhood education. Oh, she says they do. So why have they cut the funding for it then? Why have they cut the funding for it then? Because they're trimming everything, the Minister says. Well, that's right, because they, uh, they know the dollar cost of everything and the value of nothing, particularly when it comes to early childhood education. Mr Speaker, I want to move on to some of the other provisions in the bill before I run out of my time. And I want to particularly talk about the inherited privilege provisions in this bill that deal with the uh, enrolment schemes for schools, which basically give uh, peer, uh, kids whose parents have gone to a school or whose siblings have gone to a school the right to enter a, the, the right to enter a school, even if they live outside the zone, gives them preference. How is that fair? It's inherited privilege, nothing short of it. And if the government want to have that debate in an election year and go and tell people in my electorate why they can't send the kids to the school they live the closest to because this government thinks that people with an inherited privilege should have a higher priority, I will happily stand on the campaign hustings and say I think that the National Party are totally wrong in that and that the people who live the closest to the school and they're to their local school, those kids should have the priority of access to that school and they shouldn't be pushed out because of inherited privilege. Good old fashioned Tory inherited privilege, which is what this what the bill what the provisions and this bill are going to be protecting and delivering more of. And I think that stinks, Mr Speaker, and I definitely won't be supporting that. And I will happily have that argument with the National Party on the campaign hustings at every available opportunity. Finally, Mr Speaker, I want to talk about the, pathway, the pathways between school uh, employment and further education, which is covered by, uh, covered by this legislation. Uh, because the, uh, the workforce has changed and the, the range of uh, available training opportunities to young people has changed significantly uh, and, uh, over the last couple of decades. And in the Schools Plus initiative that the Labour uh, government were putting forward before the last election, I think we recognise we recognise the need uh, to continue to build on programmes like Gateway and Star and Young Apprenticeships, all programmes introduced by the last Labour government. We recognise the need to continue to build on those to ensure that every kid under the age of 18 was in some form of education, training uh, and leading towards uh, a qualified, a more qualified workforce. I think we also recognise the need no, we also recognise the need to invest in upskilling the current workforce because we have to recognise that the workforce of 20 years' time, most of the people who are going to be in the workforce in 20 years' time are already in the workforce, and we need to actually invest in upskilling those as well. Go and do the demographic. Yeah, go and do the demographic analysis. You go forward 20 years, and the workforce now, yes, that's dead right, that's exactly what I said, you go do the analysis now, in 20 years' time, most of the people in the workforce in 20 years' time will already be in the workforce today. So we have to think about... We have to think about how we're going to provide them with uh, upskilling opportunities. Will it be mem member be old enough to get a real job then? Oh, I don't know what that says about him. I don't know what that says about Mr Mallard. If I don't have a real job, I'm not entirely sure what that says about him. Seeing as he's been here since he was about 
Oh, well, for the last couple of decades, since when they were doing hands out on the stone tablets, that's how long Trevor Mallard has been in the House. So I'm not entirely sure that it reflects particularly well on him to say that members of Parliament don't have real jobs, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Mr Speaker, this, Mr Speaker, well, you know, he, he opened himself up for that. Uh, Mr Speaker, overall, the, the Labour Party uh, will not be supporting this bill because there is too much in it that we oppose, uh, so we're going to be voting against it.